So, we're live, everyone. Hello, and welcome to yet another installment of Virtual Astronomy on Top in Cambridge, where this time we are holding a Halloween special for you guys. We have a fantastic speaker lined up today. James, would you mind saying a couple of words about yourself? Sure. Um, so, hi, I'm James Matthews. I'm a Herschel Smith Fellow at uh, the Institute of Astronomy in Cambridge. I do, I'll tell you more about my research later, but I, I research things like black holes, uh, the jets they produce, the particles they accelerate, um, and the way they interact with the host galaxies. Thanks. Pass on to Haley. Hi, I'm Haley. I'm a postdoc in the maths department here at Cambridge, and I work mainly in cosmology and general relativity. Thanks. Johnny? Hi, I'm Johnny. I'm a second year PhD student at the Institute of Astronomy here in Cambridge, and I work on the uh, on terrestrial planet atmospheres. Awesome. Thank you very much. Annabelle? Hi, I'm Annabelle. I'm a second year PhD student at the Institute of Astronomy too, and I'm studying uh, galaxy clusters and black holes. Awesome. And uh, finally, my name is Asha. I'm a PhD student at the uh, Kavli Institute, of Institute for Cosmology here in Cambridge. And I am studying galaxies, their evolution, and more importantly, how they die. Uh, and today I am your technical MC. <laughs> so yeah. let's tag yeah. along for a ride. <laughs> and um, pardon? But are you going to say a few words about your face, Sasha? <laughs> Uh, thanks for pointing this out. So actually, I'm going, <laughs> I'm going to leave this as um, as a question. So if you have an idea of what I'm representing, and maybe James can guide you, please let me know. I am your, I am a theoretical physics nightmare, and you need to learn why, maybe, during the talk. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that wasn't really funny. But um, James, on that note, if you don't mind sharing your screen. Uh, for us to enjoy some actual entertaining stuff. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much. And Is that the floor, yes, it's working perfectly fine. I'll just switch the view so that we can see you well and please take it off. Take it away. Okay, so thanks for having me. Um I've always wanted to see astronomy on tap and it's a shame it's not, you know, in a real pub because I love pubs, but I'm doing my best to sort of replicate the atmosphere in my room. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you today about uh, spooky jets from black holes. So this is my attempt to sort of turn my first slide into a, a like horror movie inspired thing. Um, so please excuse like the dubious puns and all that kind of thing. So you might have seen the title and be wondering what a jet is. So before I go any further, I'm going to define that. Uh, if I can, here we go. Yeah, so a jet in astrophysics is not anything to do with an aeroplane or anything like that. It's just a narrow beam of hot material that moves very, very fast away from a black hole. And you're going to see lots more images and simulations of jets throughout the talk, but I wanted to like define that specific piece of jargon first. And the specific jet that I showed on the, uh, on the title slide is this one. So this is an image that shows, the background image shows kind of visible light with all the stars and galaxies that you can see there. And then the red is showing you radio emissions so that's been observed with a radio telescope. And what you can see here is that there's a galaxy in the center of the image and coming out of the galaxy over many thousands of light years is a sort of narrow beam of, of material that we see in radio that then hits into stuff, heats it up, and emits more radio waves. So all this red stuff you can see is connected with that jet of material. And so we're basically, throughout this talk, we're interested in understanding what these jets are, how they're produced, how they can travel to such large distances. And this particular one is one of the most famous examples of jets uh, from black holes. It's called Cygnus A. And it's called that because we name things after the constellations they lie in. Uh, so this lies in the Cygnus constellation, and this is in the northern hemisphere, so you can actually see it uh, in the night sky in summer and autumn. And it allegedly looks a little bit like a swan, but you've got to use your imagination a bit. So it's 800 million light years away, um, and yet we can still see these huge jets when we zoom in far enough with our radio telescopes. The jets are 30,000 light years long, and they appear to be connected to this uh, to this galaxy. So how are the huge jets made? And that's one of the questions we're going to ask. And I've kind of given away the, 
the punchline to that question uh, in my in the title of my talk. We know they're to do with black holes, um, but we're going to explore that in a bit more detail throughout the talk. So before we can go any further, we need to answer the question what a black hole is. And many of you might know this already, but um, it's important to get it right. So here is, uh, so there's a poll on Slido, which you can all uh, go and vote in for this, and it should be active now. And the five options I've given you, uh, so beware, there might be a few red herrings or trick ones in here, are the core of a neutron star, a portal to another universe, the ultimate fate of every star, including the sun, a region of space so dense that not even light can escape, and just a creation of science fiction. And I think I've got the right sort of hashtag for finding the Slido poll there, right? Cool. So as we are um, as we are discussing this question, I have just put it up on the screen. So that's the uh, information for uh, for you, James. And we're waiting for some uh, answers to uh, come in. So far, we've got three people um, who have responded. So we're waiting for more. And so far. I'm sorry to say, but the answers are unanimous uh, because everyone says that it's a region of space so dense that not even light can escape. I think the audience has been well trained. Okay, very <laughs> good. So I I tried to throw in a few things to like throw you off the scent to do with things that you might have heard of related to black holes, uh, but none of you fell for them, so very good. So here are kind of responses to the um, to the options. So is it, is it the core of a neutron star? It's not, but neutron stars do have a sort of connection to black holes and that they can evolve into them if they get more massive. And neutron stars themselves can actually also make jets, but I won't be, really be talking about that today. Are they a portal to another universe? I'm leaving this as a, a possible. Um, people have talked about black holes as possible wormholes uh, because they deform space and time so much. So it's possible that they are some kind of gateway to a, another universe or another part of the universe. But, you know, I like to deal in scientific things that I can measure easily, and that's kind of a bit too speculative and philosophical for this talk. They're not the ultimate fate of every star, but they are the ultimate fate of, of very massive stars. So the sun won't become a black hole, but stars which are much more massive will. So uh, the correct answer is D, and many of you got that, so that's great. And they're not creation of science fiction, even though they kind of seem like they should be. Um, and I think what that's really telling us is that reality is often stranger than anything you can come up with uh, in a sci-fi work. So perhaps a slightly more accurate definition, uh, this is very similar to the definition I had, but it's really a region of space that has a gravitational field that's so strong that no matter or radiation such as light uh, can escape. And that creates a sort of really interesting point because I mean, there must be some critical point around the black hole where some, something can no longer escape. And we know that light is the fastest thing in the universe. And so we can sort of draw this, uh, this point of no return around the black hole. And this, the more scientific name for the point of no return is the event horizon. You might have heard of this uh, phrase uh, in sci-fi films or something like that or in kind of in science books. So that's a really important uh, point uh, surface to think about in astrophysics. So why should we care about well, This is just, these are just a few things I found from Google searches on black holes. Um, the top three things are like three science fiction films that have black holes in them. And the bottom like articles are just recent articles that have been picked up by the press on black holes. And so what I'm trying to get across here is that I think there's something about black holes that's really mysterious, enigmatic, that piques our curiosity. And they kind of capture our imagination. There's something very, very mysterious about them, this idea that you can't escape from them once you get close enough, and that we don't know what lies beyond this horizon, that there's no way of seeing beyond it. So I think that's kind of why we find them interesting. And that's actually why I got into astrophysics in the first place, because I found black holes so interesting. But from a scientific perspective, they're also really, really useful. They allow us to test the limits of our physical theories, like general relativity. Uh, so that's Einstein's theory of relativity. 
And they're also really important for explaining why the universe looks the way it does. So why it evolves the way it does, why the galaxies have the appearance that they have. It turns out that the black holes are really important for determining that. And there are many more reasons why black holes are important. Um, this Wikipedia article I put up here is, is something I like to read sometimes. It just, it's just a list of various unsolved problems in physics. And it's kind of nice to skim it occasionally to remind us physicists why we're doing what we're doing, and which problems we want to solve. The list is quite long, so there are plenty of things that physicists don't understand, but that also makes things interesting because if we knew everything, there wouldn't be any research to do. And if you go and read that article, you'll find lots of, uh, there are lots of examples that are specific to do a black holes. Some are uh, very astronomy based and some are a bit more philosophical and, and kind of um, speculative. So hopefully you care about black holes. The sort of next obvious question to ask is, how do we know they exist? I've, I've given you a definition of what a black hole is. I've said they're interesting, but that doesn't prove that they exist. That just, they could just be a creation of, of a theorist, of a mathematician, right? And it's an interesting question because normally when we try to prove the existence of something uh, in astronomy, we look at the light that it emits. So, you know, if we want to prove the existence of a star, we can go and observe the light that's coming towards us. We can study it. We can learn more about the system. But black holes in their very essence are dark things. So how do we prove the existence of them and how do we study them further? So there are probably other uh, ways you can think of other than the three I've come up with, but basically the things I could think of off the, top, off the top of my head that I think are good ways to look for the, the existence of something dark are shadows. If it casts a shadow on something that emits light, you can tell it's there. Another way of looking for indirect evidence of it is looking for evidence, evidence of its gravity. And there's also this final thing called accretion, uh, which I'll explain later as that's a little bit more complicated. So let's start with the first two. So we actually, Annabelle actually has this as her background image. Um, there you go. And uh, probably many of you saw it when uh, it first came out. So this is the first ever direct image of a black hole. Uh, so what you see is light being emitted very, very close to the black hole. And then this shadow region in the middle is the evidence of the black hole. So that's the shadow I'm referring to. There is a sort of interesting philosophical question here about whether detecting something shadow is really detecting it. Um, and that's kind of one for another day. But what's really important is that this is very, very strong evidence that black holes exist. And it also confirmed many of our theories that we have for understanding them to do with how light should travel around the black hole. And this specific black hole is in the galaxy M87. So that's uh, an image of the galaxy in the bottom left there. And if you're kind of eagle eyed, you might notice that there's a kind of uh, ray of light coming out of the center of the galaxy. And this was first noticed in 1918, so just over 100 years ago. Uh, where someone basically was cataloging the galaxies and they, and they said, oh, a curious straight ray emanates from the, uh, from the nucleus of the galaxy. And they didn't really know what it was, but it turned out that it was the first ever observation of a jet from a black hole. And so it's kind of fitting that 100 years after that was discovered, uh, we were then able to, with you know, huge technological advances, look much, much closer in on the galaxy and zoom right into the center and observe, observe this black hole in exactly the same galaxy where the jet was first discovered, which I think is a nice piece of like symmetry. So that's the kind of shadow way of proving that black holes exist. And that's very kind of up to date. We've only just been able to do that in, in astronomy. And this one is also, also very up to date, um, but we can look for evidence of gravity. So what this movie shows is stars orbiting the black hole in the center of the Milky Way. So there are a few, so basically all these little blobs you see are stars uh, in the galactic center, in the center of the Milky Way. And you can see they're all kind of going around a central point, but there's nothing at that central point. So there are other things to notice, like the, uh, the stars that are closest to the center of the image are moving faster. And you see a couple of them in particular do like a little loop on their orbit. 
And so from this, we can work out, we can track the stars over many years. We can track their positions. We can work out what their speeds are. And then from that, we can um, work out how massive the thing that they're orbiting is. And we know that it's dark. And so from that, we can work out that there's a black hole there. And so this has been in the news recently. So I'm struggling to change slide here. That's perfectly fine. Um, as you're changing, uh, as you're changing the slide, let me just uh, let me just say that we have uh, questions coming in for you. So be ready <laughs> for answering okay, cool. them once we're um, once we're done. So I'm just gonna have to. Can you still see my screen? Um, not at the moment, but that's no problem. You can blame it on me. I'm the technical MC. <laughs> okay, two sex. That's all right. I guess in the meantime, a cool fact is that like when when we saw those tracks of the stars, right, like you, as James said, you can figure out the mass of the thing that must be in the middle. And I remember doing this calculation in like undergrad astronomy and you come up with like a million times the mass of the sun or something. Is that right, James? Like you just get this ridiculous mass for something that's really tiny. Yeah. And yeah. that's 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 exactly the point, right? Like. Um, being able to work out that there's such a huge amount of mass in such a small space that doesn't emit any light, what else can that be other than a black hole? Yeah, cool stuff. Carry so you on. can see this again now, right? Yeah, yeah, that's good. Cool. So that uh, what Haley said kind of brings me quite nicely onto this slide. Um, so this is the kind of press release for the Nobel Prize in Physics this year, uh, which was given so the prize is quite often shared between different people, it was shared, shared between Roger Penrose, Genzel, and Andrea Gaze. And so uh, Gaze and Genzel were responsible for leading the teams that did these observations, uh, of working out that there was a, a black hole in the center of our galaxy. If you look carefully at the text that the Nobel Committee write here, they say a supermassive compact object at the center of the galaxy. And that's because they don't want to com completely commit to it being a black hole, right? We're pretty, pretty sure it's a black hole, but what all we can really know is that there is something super massive, dark and compact there. So the Nobel Prize Committee is quite pedantic in exactly how it words things. So their observations were really cool because they were like a triumph, a triumph of uh, imagination and ambition. Andrea Gaze in particular asked people to do observations that had never been done before. And when she first suggested them, they said, oh, you're crazy, this can never be done. But she kept pushing because she had the vision to like make it happen. Um, and also the engineering that enabled those observations to take place was quite incredible. And I really like this prize for two reasons, not only because it's to do with black holes and that's the field that I work in. So it's, it's nice to see it recognized, but also because Roger Penrose is, is a theoretical physicist and a mathematician, and the other two are observers and experimentalists, it kind of shows you the two sides of science uh, meshing together. So I really like that. And I think uh, Ash is gonna tell us more about what she has on her face, but I guess it's kind of inspired by a lot of Penrose's mathematics because um, he was interested in the geometry of space when it gets deformed by a black hole. Um, and he put in place many of the mathematical tools we need to understand black holes. Thank you. I uh, appreciate that. <laughs> cool. So uh, Penrose did a lot of stuff to do with describing like the extremes of black hole physics uh, with quite complicated maths. He also came up with something called the Penrose process. So he was able to show that you could actually extract energy from very close to a black hole. You can't extract energy from within the black hole itself because that's beyond this point of no return. But just outside the black hole, there's this kind of special region uh, where you can extract energy from it, particularly if the black hole is spinning. So the way to imagine this is uh, if you're, say you wanna get on a merry-go-round or a roundabout or something that's spinning around very quickly and you, you sort of run towards it, if it's spinning fast enough, it will just kind of push you away and fling you fling you off quite quickly. And so uh, if it's traveling fast enough and you are sort of moving towards it, you can actually quite slowly, you can actually get flung out more quickly than you went in. And you will also slow the merry-go-round down, but only by a tiny amount because the merry-go-round is much bigger than you. 
So the same, basically the same thing can happen with a black hole. It can be spinning around and you try and some material is kind of falling into it. It's sucked in by the gravity. Um, and if conditions are right, the black hole can give that material some energy and fling it out very, very quickly. So Penrose kind of put in place the basic idea of this. And then uh, two scientists at Cambridge, actually, Roger Blamford and Roman Schnayek. I think Roman Schnayek still lives in Cambridge. They showed uh, in a, a very important paper that the rotational energy of the black hole can power a jet of material. And this has now been verified with numerical simulations using hydrodynamics, where we're able to people are able to show that the black hole spinning powers this big jet of material that's very, very fast. And so this is the one of the only really viable theoretical mechanisms for explaining the jets that we see in our observations. So let's just quickly talk about that a little bit more. And I said I'd talk about this process called accretion, and that's what I'm going to do now. So I want you to imagine that there's a black hole and that uh, something is falling towards it. When it does that, it can convert gravitational energy into thermal energy, so that's heat and radiation. And um, this is done, this is a very similar principle to how a hydroelectric power station operates. So uh, when we have a hydroelectric power station, we, we basically store water up somewhere high. So it has gravitational potential energy. And then the water flows down. It has some, some motion energy, kinetic energy then. And then eventually it passes through a turbine or something and generates electricity. And it's not quite the same here, but it's exactly the same principle. When something's far away, it has gravitational energy it falls down close to the black hole and then it starts to hit other things and everything sort of heats up and glows exactly like in this artist's impression here. And we call this this disk of hot material that uh, forms the accretion disk. And accretion is just this kind of general process of falling onto the black hole. So the material gradually spirals in like in this picture and as it gets really, really close to the black hole, the black hole spin energy uh, this process that I talked about in the previous slide is able to be transferred to the, some of that material and it can blow it out in a jet. And this material can be ejected at close to the speed of light, which is pretty crazy. So that's the kind of general principle. There's a lot of active study going into this uh, still at the moment. It's not the sort of general principles are understood quite well, but the detailed physics gets very, very complicated very quickly. Um, so this is an area of active research and lots of people at Cambridge are working on how the disk is connected to the jet, um, exactly how the material spirals into the black hole uh, and that kind of thing. And this just this slide is just to give you a feel for what the observational results are. So the, on the previous slide, I gave you like a theoretical picture and an artist's impression. The images here are all re real astronomical images, mostly uh, taken in the radio. So. Uh, we use radio telescopes to look at these things because that's the wave band that they emit in. And these are just some of the most famous examples of, of jets uh, from black holes. So uh, Centaurus A is that one in the uh, top left. Fornax A is this beautiful kind of slightly uh, wider one in the middle there. Cygnus A I've already shown you. And then M87 is exactly the same source that we discussed earlier where the black hole image has been taken in. And the, uh, the collaboration that made that black hole image, it made this really nice zoom in. So each of these kind of pictures here is zooming in um, by quite large factors. So the, the light, the scale of the image in light years is shown there. And so as we look with basically gradually more high resolution and more powerful telescopes, we can look closer and closer to the black hole. And that's kind of the most direct proof yet really that the black hole is powering this huge jet. It's fairly it's fairly hard to deny because when you look at the bottom of the jet, you see a black hole. It's, it's a sort of very obvious causal connection between the two. So uh, I want to quickly talk about my research. I just have a couple of slides left. Um, so, so far I've given you a kind of general introduction to black hole jets and the physics behind them. Uh, I study black hole jets among some other things, um, particularly their their journey from the black hole to deep space, the particles they accelerate on the way, these particles are the things that actually give us the radio emission that we observe, and the connection between this disk of material and the, and the jet. And one of my other key research interests is the origin of cosmic rays, which I'll explain in a second. 
and these uh, these are, are particles which may actually come from jets as well. So uh, I work mostly on theoretical work, particularly using computational models. So this is an example of some hydrodynamic simulations from a paper uh, a year ago. So these are basically the same kind of simulations you might use to understand the weather or some other fluid, uh, something that moves like a fluid. So if you were doing simulations of tides or of the Earth's atmosphere, you can use the same kind of techniques that we use in astrophysics. But now instead of studying something on small scales, relatively small scales like that, we're now uh, making a very big simulation that's uh, covering a huge scale and running uh, in the simulation, we simulate millions of years. It doesn't take millions of years to run, but that's the, the sort of physical time that we simulate it for. And so what you can see here is a simulation of the jet. And this is like the jet propagating into space and it inflates this kind of bubble and you get all sorts of interesting things going on. So the thing on the left is showing you um, something called the Mach number. So that's whether or not the material is supersonic. And the thing on the right is showing you just the speed. And so the fact that uh, this is the speed divided by the speed of light. And so the fact that the material is very, very blue in the middle of the jet there is showing you that the material is moving very close to the speed of light. And you get all sorts of other stuff going on, like um, kind of turbulence. It looks a bit like smoke uh, near the bottom here. And that's because a lot of the physics to do with uh, how the material moves around is quite similar to smoke moving through the atmosphere. And the reason I was interested in these jets is whether they could accelerate particles to very, very high energy. And that's where cosmic rays come in. So cosmic rays are kind of confusingly named because they're not really rays at all. They were first discovered as rays, but they're really particles that hit the atmosphere. And this image on the top right here shows something called a cloud chamber. So this is a kind of chamber of uh, alcohol solution and it can detect particles that pass through it. And so uh, you might see these sometimes in like science museums and stuff like that. Basically, if you just make a big enough tank and you leave it lying around and you put the right thing in it, you'll detect particles. And there are lots of cool animations of this on YouTube. And depending on the exact track that passes through, it's a different type of particle. And so we can make like more high tech versions of these and detect cosmic rays uh, at very, very high energies. These ones are extremely rare. So you have to build a very, very big detector the highest energy cosmic rays arrive at a rate of once per square kilometer per century. So if you want to detect more than like two, you have to build a huge detector that is able to cover a, a huge area. And so people have done that and we're able to work out uh, where they come from on the sky. And then from that, we can compare to where different uh, sources are on the sky to try and figure out where these cosmic rays come from. And some of my work has been to uh, to demonstrate that they could come from uh, from black hole jets. So that's why I wanted to kind of briefly mention that uh, part of my research. So I'll finish up now. Uh, my conclusions are that there are these really quite spectacular jets that we observe in radio waves. And we now know that they're clearly connected to the black hole. And this fits in well with theoretical work that shows that the spin energy of the black hole can provide the thrust for these jets. There have been a whole host of recent kind of technical advances that um, have given us the most detailed picture yet of the connection between the jets and the black holes. And they really create quite beautiful structures on the sky. Um, so I'd encourage you to go away and look at uh, more radio observations of black holes and, the, and their jets. Um, and they might accelerate, accelerate the highest energy cosmic rays. And yeah, the other thing you should go, go and look at is definitely those. Uh, if, you, if you just search YouTube for cloud chamber cosmic ray then it's hours of fun basically right awesome thanks thank you very much james that was that was a wonderful wonderful talk uh i enjoyed it so much uh thank you very very much for it um and i think the audience enjoyed it much as well because we have um quite a number of questions for you if that's okay so many questions <laughs> <laughs> people, love, people love black holes i'm telling you it's a hot topic yeah. <laughs> um i uh, for real though uh would you be all right to um to answer some of the questions then
Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Awesome. So I'll read them to you and um, and uh, we, you can go ahead and asking them. Actually, at this point, you can stop sharing your screen, I think. Uh, if, uh, if there is a need, we'll return, uh, we'll return uh, to the sharing. Fantastic. So the first question comes from, uh, comes from Jack Turner, um, who, um, who asks, how many jets have scientists seen? Cool. Okay. Uh, the answer is a lot. Um, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head what the latest surveys, um, have shown. So I think we're probably looking at, uh, tens of thousands of, oh. <laughs> of so we can't be totally sure that all of those are jets so the what the ones i showed you are kind of the most spectacular relatively nearby sources um and basically we have what we call surveys so radio telescopes go away and look at lots of different bits of the sky and sometimes they see huge big jet like structures sometimes they see much smaller things and it's harder to tell if they're definitely a jet uh, but yeah definitely it's you know it's probably more like hundreds of really really well resolved jet structures and then thousands and thousands of radio emitting uh black galaxies with black holes in their centers oh. and we also can observe jets in our own galaxy as well uh from from lower mass black holes and these are really cool to study because they actually vary so we can uh we can like watch the jets move over human time scales, which we can't do with the supermassive black holes because they take too long to move. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we've got another question rated high it comes from Noah. And the question is how big can black hole get? Can black holes get? So I guess in principle, there's no, uh, there's no strict limit. So um, exactly how the black hole forms is it, it needs to collapse from something. Um, and then it can keep sucking in more material. So this accretion process that I talked about is a way in which the black hole can grow. So the, the only thing that's really stopping it um, get really big is that it needs to suck in enough material. So um, there's an there's actually a sort of limit to how quickly it can do that because if it sucks it in too quickly, then the stuff gets really hot and um, and emits light which blows away some of the material. So that's called the Eddington limit, and that was discovered by Arthur Eddington at Cambridge as well. Um, so so this kind of gives you a maximum rate at which the black hole can grow, and then it's just how long the universe has been around for and how long that black hole has been ex in existence for, and I think. The most massive black holes are around about 10 billion times the mass of the sun. Pretty, uh, pretty hard numbers Which, to imagine. Yeah, it's pretty big. <laughs> so that's the short answer. Uh, pretty big. So uh, moving on to the next question, we've got, oh, it, it actually came from Noah as well. Um, if you don't mind, how many kinds of black holes are there? So I guess it I guess it depends a bit what you mean by kind, but um, at its heart, a black hole is very simple. Uh, although the sort of the physics of describing it is complicated, there are only a few different types of uh, like qualities that a black hole can have. Right? It has a mass, it has a spin, uh, it has a charge. Technically, I think that's it, right? If I missed yeah. anything. So we call yeah. this has a bit of a stupid name. It's called the no hair theorem. Uh, black holes have really no hair know why it's, black holes have no hair and the idea is i guess they just mean that you don't need very many variables to describe a black hole um but so that so you know the 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 bit beyond the horizon itself yeah only has like three variables describing it but in terms of how it can look how the material around it can look then you get all sorts of different physics basically so there are probably uh, dozens of different classes of types of black holes and astronomy often works by sort of categorizing things based on how they look in the sky at first and then we work on understanding the physics behind them and 
a lot of what we see is very, very hard to explain. So that's one of the reasons why we all have a job, which is cool. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> uh, so I think you've answered the next question somewhere in your talk. Uh, but if you don't mind reminding us, how big are space jets? So it's sort of similar to the how big can black holes get because that um, they take time to travel distance, even though they're moving very fast, the distances involved are so big. Um, so it basically depends how long the jet has been going for and how long it's been sucking material in and spewing it out again. Uh, so the biggest ones are about a million light years across, which is, yeah, I mean, that's just crazy big. Um, yeah, they have a whole range of sizes between, you know, a few thousand light years to that those huge big ones so and now that you've said um a million light years for comparison right real quick for for the audience the light traveling between us and the sun takes eight light minutes correct yeah, yeah so <laughs> maybe that gives a, a better a better feel <laughs> for um for how how large that is thank you i mean th there are still a couple of questions to go are you okay with that <laughs> mm -hmm. awesome Awesome. So um, I've actually, uh, okay, so we've answered this one, but oh, uh, that's a pretty cute one. Could a black hole suck up the moon? So if the moon came close enough to a black hole, then yes. But th this is a question that quite often gets asked about black holes, so it's important to clarify this. Um, so we think of black holes as these things that like wander around eating everything, right? That's kind of the the sort of sci-fi image of what a black hole is it sucks you in it's scary and i guess the fact that we're doing our halloween issue on that is appropriate but they they obey a black hole follows the rules of gravity just like anything else so the gravitational field we uh the gravitational pull we feel towards a black hole that has the same mass as the sun is exactly the same as the gravitational pull we feel towards the sun, right? So if you replace the sun with a black hole that has the same mass, everything would go dark and that would have some disastrous consequences, but our orbit would actually stay exactly the same. Um, so nothing would change there. So what I'm basically trying to say is that the, the only time you get like this sucking everything in thing is when you get close enough to a black hole that its gravity is really strong. And most black holes are so, far spaced out that we never get close to any of them and so the danger of it ever affecting us is like minuscule um so yeah in principle if you if you i don't know if you fired the moon at a black hole or something then it would suck it up and it would probably get hot and emit some light uh, but it's it's never going to happen in a in a sort of reasonable time frame Thanks. I think that clarified um, a lot of worries <laughs> and a lot of uh, questions that people often uh, come up with. Thank you. Um, there is a, a fairly uh, a fairly in depth question, which is: Can space jets travel faster than light, and how fast can a space jet travel? Um, so I think uh, I think you mentioned that they are pretty fast, but how fast can they get? Yeah, so that's a great question. So they can't travel faster than the absolute speed of light in a vacuum. So light has a speed. If you if you create a vacuum, so something that has no air in it, and you fire light through that, it has a very, very well-defined speed. Um, and we can measure that speed. And uh, that's kind of the foundation of a lot of Einstein's work was that that is the kind of maximum speed at which anything can travel. So jets can't travel faster than that. They can travel very, very close to that speed. And they can actually travel faster than the speed of light in the medium that they're moving through. So that's a bit of a complicated point I appreciate. So light slows down as it moves through certain materials. And so that means that the jet can, in principle, outstrip the speed of that. But it can't beat the speed of light if it's in a vacuum. I hope that makes sense because it's quite, quite a kind of subtle point. Well, uh, given that, uh, given that, luckily, uh, we are recording this because it's obviously YouTube. Uh, I hope that the subtle point can be then rewinded afterwards in case uh, Bella wants to clarify uh, their question. Yep. Awesome. It's a very good question. Though. 
<laughs> yeah. So that's a shout out to to our audience. Uh, we have um, a uh, more straightforward question, actually, which is how can you break a black hole? I'm not sure if I understand uh, the question correctly. Can maybe let's rephrase it. Can you break break a black hole at all? <laughs> Uh, is that a straightforward question? I don't know if that is. <laughs> I was going to say, that's a really hard question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I guess it means like, can a black hole can just be destroyed like yeah, that? Yeah, I think, I think that's the question. Also, I said it's straightforward because I just glanced over it and thought, oh, it only consists of a couple of words. I'm sure it's simple. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I can't think of any way in which you could like split a black hole in two or anything. Okay. Um, you can merge black holes together. So like when they detected gravitational waves, that was from two black holes spiraling together. But I can't think of a way in which you could like reverse the process and split them apart. Um, so I have a question then. Um, can, will black holes exist until the end of the universe then? Or the ones that exist just eternally exist? So that's a good question. Uh, there is actually something which I didn't talk about uh, in my talk called Hawking radiation. So this is uh, a prediction that was made by Hawking and Penrose, I think, or it might have just been Hawking. Um, and it's again, a, a sort of one of these uh, theoretical predictions about black holes. But in principle, if you leave a black hole sitting in space, then a small amount of stuff can leak out of the black hole. Uh, Hawking showed this. And this kind of tests are like theories of physics to their limits. But I guess if you leave a black hole there for long enough, and this really is like an insane amount of time, uh, then it would gradually lose its material. And it was, would also be so far away from stuff if this was very late on in the universe that it wouldn't be able to accrete more material. So eventually they would, I, I think that is a, a robust prediction that eventually they would radiate all the uh, their mass away. Okay, cool. And it's also a theory that we cannot prove for now because the time it would take for a black hole to like evaporate is longer than the universe, the age of the universe for now. <laughs> so it's not something we can prove <laughs> yet. <laughs> yeah, so if they were to all stop accreting, if we got to the end of the universe where everything was just black holes, it, they'd all accreted all the rest of the material and it was just black holes then they might start leaking away and sort of shrinking. Cool. Well, they, they still leak right now, but the quantity is too um, small. So like you could see the detection once like it evaporates completely. So at the end, it would be like a big burst of evaporation kind of of emission. But as we're not there yet, we cannot see it. Yeah. Like the evaporation is too small right now to see it. Cool. That makes sense. So, uh, actually, <laughs> we got uh, we got pretty uh, pretty far off <laughs> the question of how to break a black hole. But I think I think the audience uh, appreciates our in depth uh, in depth uh, discussion. Um, so, since we have still a couple questions left, let me try to run through them real quick so that we can move on to the game and also so that we can give uh, James a bit of a break. <laughs> He's been talking for a, uh, for a while now, poor guy. All right, cool. So uh, we've got a question, which is, what is the color of a space jet? Do they have a color? Ooh, yeah, so the, one of the things that's confusing about a lot of astronomy images is sometimes we're looking in, in a, at a wavelength of light that we can't see ourselves, right? So you have to kind of imagine that you put on special goggles that can see in the radio or um or see in the infrared or whatever wavelength of light it is so most of the emission most of the light that we see from jets is radio waves but not all of it and sometimes they do actually emit visible light um it just depends on the exact sort of nature of the the jet and how powerful it is and which way it's pointing and stuff like that um so i guess in principle well, so there was there was an image in my talk that was a real optical image, actually. Um, and I'll remind myself what color that was. Two of them look like they were red. 
I think the red ones are uh, radio? radio ones. I, yeah. Well, I think you've had, an, wasn't it an optical image of M87 with a blue jet? Yeah, so, Ooh, I think. so that's sort of blue looking, yeah. yeah. But I, I think the answer is probably all colours of the rainbow or something like that. <laughs> and beyond. <laughs> that includes, that includes um, light that we can't see. So they, they really do emit all sorts of different wavelengths across the spectrum. Nice. Thank you. Um, we've got uh, a question, I think, verging on what we've discussed before, but uh, but not exactly similar. Can a black hole jet reach the Earth? Is it dangerous? Spooky. S <laughs> Spooky, yeah. <laughs> so bas basically, no. Like, we don't have anything to worry about. Um, there was actually a study recently where someone looked at um, sort of where the safest places to be in the galaxy are and perhaps not surprisingly we are in one of the safest places of the galaxy because we're far away from any like nasty things that can shoot out intense radiation or something like that um, so yeah basically the the jets from black holes from the galaxy can't travel far enough to get to us um, and we're in a we're in a nice safe little haven in terms of where we are in the galaxy Nice. Uh, I think that's good to know on a spooky night. Um, <laughs> we'll make it to next Halloween. Oh. <laughs> yes. Actually, so we've got, um, I think, um, well, it's not linked to the Nobel Prize, but the question is, when was a black hole discovered? How was it discovered? Well, maybe it is linked to the Nobel Prize. Yeah. Um, so... It, dep it depends what your sort of definition of discovered is to an extent. Um, I guess they were a kind of, they were a prediction of Einstein's work, but that's a, that's a prediction. Um, and then we started to see evidence of um, this accretion process that I talked about probably in the sixties and seventies, but we wouldn't have necessarily known that there was a black hole involved. Um, so it's really been like gradual accumulation of evidence. Um, and I think the Nobel Prize is a recognition that that was when it was like really, really nailed down. Like we've known for, you know, probably 30 years, we basically known that black holes exist, maybe a bit longer. But that was like sort of very, very hard to argue with, particularly the image, right? There's, you know, there's obviously a shadow there. Yeah. You'd have to be very like contrary to say that wasn't a black hole. Um, so yeah, that was a bit of a non-committal answer, but hopefully that gives a feel <laughs> so for it. I, I think to put to put dates on it, um, well, if we are to be very hazy about it, well, less hazy, it, it was 1965, I think, Roger Penrose's uh, paper, that's 1965, officially, that's when, I think, that's when black holes were born as a concept, if you will, and they were called a black hole. Uh, but I think, I think our first indication of, um, of black holes existing came a little bit before that, 1963 or something, the discovery yeah, of the first quasar? 19... Oh, 1964 was the first like observation that we thought was a black hole. Okay. But it took until like 1972 to be sure, sure that it was a black hole. And it was like a black hole that was with uh, a binary star. So it was like a black hole and a star. And by looking at how the star was moving, we could find the mass and the size of the object with it and we couldn't see the object and it was something like um i don't remember uh, the size but it was like way too small and too big to be anything else in a black hole uh, but it took like 10 years for scientists to agree that it was that because it was so absurd um, i guess it just reflects like the nature of science that you sort of have a something controversial at first and then we gradually like reach a consensus and we're like oh yeah it probably is a black hole at first yeah. people debate it a lot and then we gradually like agree which is good yep fair point uh so we have a fairly precise question um i don't know which part of your talk it concerns but it is coming from someone named piotr and the question is what causes the jet material to bounce back against the jet direction I think it might be referring to your um, simulations. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the reason is 
because um, the jet is actually lighter than its surroundings. So it's like struggling to, but it, but it's very powerful. So it's like struggling to push stuff out of the way. So it's kind of like a snow plow or something. Um, so yeah, you can, you can imagine like trying to move snow out of the way. And that's what the jet's doing as it's plowing into the, to the space. Uh, so even though the stuff it's going into is actually very like light, there's not much, there's not much density there. Um, the jet is even lighter, but it's very powerful. And so the material gets to the end and it kind of has to go somewhere. So it turns around and go backwards. And I like to think of it as being a little bit like a fountain. Like, you know, when you see a fountain, it like shoots up and then it, and then it sort of loses power and has nowhere to go and it comes back down again. Um, yeah. That's, um, that's really nice. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a very insightful explanation. Um, so actually we have, uh, um, we have a question, uh, on YouTube, uh, on YouTube. So sorry for, uh, switching. I'm trying to read it out now. Um, are black holes always there in the center of every galaxy Is that coming from, um, Lakshmi Anil Kumar? Pretty much. Yeah. Like we, not all of them are what we call active. So they're not all, uh, accreting stuff and, and shining light. But we think that basically every galaxy of a certain size has a black hole in the center. Um, and you can do observations of other galaxies where you look at the, um, the motion close to the black hole and work out stuff about the black hole. They always seem to be there. So uh, actually, when we talk about motion, I think it very well uh, comes into, we're getting close to the, question, to the end of the question list, I promise. Uh, the question is, can black holes move? Can they themselves move? Yep. Uh, they can move around just like, just like any other uh, star in many ways. Um, so for example, we talked about the gravitational waves earlier. Those two, those are two black holes that were orbiting each other like this, and then they gradually spiral in. And as they get very, very close, they emit gravitational waves, which we detect on Earth. Um, but in the galaxy, there are sort of uh, what we call stellar mass black holes. So black holes that are comparable in mass to the sun or a few times the sun. Um, and they will be moving around in the galaxy as influenced by the, the gravity of other things in the galaxy, just like stars are. Um, and then every, every, I guess every galaxy is also moving relative to every other galaxy. So every black hole in the center of each galaxy is moving relative to every other black hole in the center of each galaxy. And it gets very confusing very quickly. That's a lot of things to keep track of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, you were talking about um, stellar mass um, black holes and, and a related question that popped up from Timothy is how many black holes are there in the solar system? So I think this needs to be clarified as well. You answered that before, but let's make it clear. <laughs> So none that we know of, uh, there are certainly none that are, um, you know, of a, of a decent size, because then we would know they were there from their gravity. Right. Um, so there are, there are plenty of black hole systems in the galaxy itself, but the galaxy has, you know, a billion stars or so. Um, and they're very, very spread out throughout the galaxy. We don't know of any, uh, in the solar system, there has been some suggestion that there might be a small black hole out beyond Pluto somewhere. Um, so people sometimes call that, that there's been like very speculative indirect evidence that there might be a planet nine or something that, that distorts the orbits of the other things. And um, actually Annabelle's PhD supervisor had an idea about this black, this planet nine, maybe being a black hole. Um, and he was talking about it when we had coffee the other day. Um, so, you know, it's, we can't completely rule it out. And we also can't rule out there being many much smaller black holes, very tiny black holes. Uh, but basically the answer is, is prob probably none, but wouldn't want to bet on it. <laughs> oh, that makes the Halloween spooky. <laughs> yeah. Black hole at the edge of the solar system. <laughs> So um, now the last two questions can actually be formulated into one because we've got Indy who's asking, is there a better word than spaghettification yet? 
And also, Noah is asking what can cause spaghettification. Would you ever get a better word than spaghettification, though? <laughs> <laughs> it's probably the best, like, scientific term ever. <laughs> agree, agree uh, entirely. <laughs> I mean, so this is like the idea that if you got close to a black hole, you would be like ripped into like strands of things like spaghetti i think right um and i guess no one's come up with a word which sticks in people's consciousness quite like spaghettification <laughs> um, a graphic yeah pretty yeah. graphic but you don't have to worry about it unless you get really really close to the black hole so just don't do that <laughs> we'll try to avoid uh black holes then <laughs> Thanks for Most sensible know. advice we've ever had in astronomy on tap. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go near a black hole. <laughs> Take a different route to work. <laughs> yes. All right. So, um, so on that note, um, on that note, uh, I think we're done with questions. Woohoo! Well done, James. You've survived. <laughs> yeah. And we can move on uh, to our spooky game. So right now, I will switch to uh, the spooky game mode and we will have only the speaker highlighted which means activated. pardon i said spooky game mode activated yes spooky game <laughs> mode activated indeed that's what's happening so i need to make sure that i'm doing it correctly oh my oh. <laughs> Uh, that I launched the correct things being an MC isn't that easy. Okay, here we go. Oh, just doing that. We just like also just want to say thanks to everyone who asked those questions because they were bloody sick and there were like so many awesome questions and you guys are obviously like really clever about black holes and now even more clever. So <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you. Yep. Uh, extending uh, the thank yous. I've just launched. I've just launched the game on Slido. So if you're interested in joining in uh, please go to um, slido.com we have a hashtag aot that's where you are asking uh, questions to james but in case you are doing it on youtube still you can uh, now move on to slido james by the way you're most welcome to join in um you may have seen many of those images before but it might be fun as well <laughs> so um so in order to follow through you you will watch the images with us on YouTube and we'll answer in Slido. So, guys, uh, Annabelle and Johnny, are you happy to take it away? Yeah, cool. Yeah. Annabelle, do you want to go first? I think you were Just starting. Just introduce the game. game. Yeah, I will. Yeah. So um, <laughs> we're doing a spooky astronomy game. Um, so we'll all look at some images and you'll need to decide either what are we looking at or what's the name of it um trying to decide and figure out and it's all related to kind of spooky astronomy so you'll see what it looks like the whole database and of course it's astronomy on tap so we like to catch you out occasionally um so beware some of the joke answers might not be jokes <laughs> or it could be a double bluff who knows <laughs> all right should we should we get going Yep, absolutely. You've got the cool. first image uh, uh, live. Cool. So this is the first image, it's a, uh, it's a spooky sort of skull thing, kind of thing, that are spotted by uh, spotted by NASA. Um, what is it, basically? That's what we're asking. What do you think it is? Is it a skull? Is it an asteroid? Is it a moon? Or is it our wonderful Haley when she's had too many to drink? It's a... Uh... <laughs> Uh, hey, Haley, you're on mute. Yeah, yeah, I know. I realize that now. I had too okay. much. <laughs> <laughs> the similarity is uncanny, honestly. I had to... I'm joking, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, you might be laughing, but it plays out really nicely with you guys in the corner and Haley comparing herself to the uh, to the skull. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish we had a screenshot of that. <laughs> Don't worry, it is that's... recorded for life. <laughs> oh, okay, that's definitely going on the Twitter then. Guys, I love it. <laughs> so um, as we go to Slido, because you guys have to remember that we have a little bit of a delay between us and mm. the audience, um, we've got uh, so far we've got answers which are half and half a skull as and an asteroid. Uh, but let us wait uh, for a little bit. 
although I've obviously set the YouTube stream settings to allow us for the smoothest connection with the audience, you know, it <laughs> uh, we we have limitations. <laughs> the MC apologizes. I'm glad that no one thinks that it's me yet. So that's that's good. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Let's keep it that way, guys. Come on. <laughs> well, uh, well, a, a Joe Cancer would also be, you know, um, would also be in in place, but that's okay. <laughs> well, don't give it away. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not giving it away at all. Um... <laughs> How many votes do we have, Sony? So oh, right now we. Five we... Votes right now we have six uh six votes Ooh. and i think um i think the reason why the answers are coming in so uh slowly is because people can already vote on everything so they're kind of i think they're uh, focusing they're on us through. yeah and they're yeah. getting through but as far as the six answers are going luckily Haley, nobody picked you yet and i don't think this Yay! is going to be the case <laughs> <laughs> but we've got a winning uh a winning asteroid that's um yeah that's 50 percent uh then we heard the second one is a skull and the third one is a moon so this uh this wasn't a trick one this is actually an asteroid um it's got the catchy name of 2015 tb145 <laughs> so they really know how to name them um they think and it's discovered by nasa as i said um it actually flew by earth last halloween 31st of october 2019 spooky isn't it it's uh, that's why we kicked it off with this one it's a real yeah so, so it is a real asteroid. They think it's a dead comet, um, uh, but I'm not sure why it has that shape. Um, it is kind of uh, spooky. Yeah. I'd probably say that it's coincidence, but <laughs> prove me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> There'll be a paper about it soon. <laughs> you know how April Fools people do fun ones. We'll do a we'll do a Halloween one explaining this comet. There we go. <laughs> A point. Should we go on to the, the second one? Absolutely. It's live. Oh, well, first of all, everyone, well done for getting it right and not falling for our trick. Um, so, yeah, this uh, scary nebula, um, it's in the large uh, Magellanic Cloud, uh, which is a sort of small galaxy next to ours. Um, and, yeah, what is it called? So it's got a bit more of a creative name than the, the, the dead, uh, dead comet. Um, uh, and it's one of those three there. So yeah, is it the, the Devil's Nebula? Is it the Evil Eye Nebula? Sort of grimacing at us, giving us the evil eyes. Uh, or is it the Ghost's Head Nebula? <laughs> Not quite as evil as Asher's eyes, but... Uh... <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> Just while people are voting, it's a little bit of other like info there. It's uh, 170,000 light years from Earth. Um, that's how far that the large Magellanic cloud is, um, so, and its eyes are actually uh, star-forming regions. So that's why they're extra bright in this ooh, image. Ooh, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, I saw I yeah, nice eyes. I thought you gave away the answer by saying eyes, but then I realized that no, all of um, all of the answers actually can have eyes. <laughs> Smart. Smart. Ghosts have eyes, right? Ghosts have eyes. Oh, yeah. Of course. Casper has eyes. Of course. S uh, so we've got, um, we've got answers being split equally between the Devil's Nebula and Evil Eyes Nebula. And the Ooh. one that has least number of votes is the Ghost Head Nebula. Any takes? Oh, would you like to reveal the correct answer? Yep, I'm happy to. Uh, I'm happy to switch to the presentation whenever you're ready. Oh no! Yeah, wait, let's go for it. Wait, does it have? Does it have a? Uh, does it have a, an answer? Does it? No. Yeah, there uh, <laughs> should be should be a tick somewhere. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. So I think the way we've set up Slido does not allow us to have a tick. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Um, yeah, no, it does. Ta da! I've showed the correct answer. Yay! Well done. Hey. <laughs> Yes, it's actually the Ghost Head Nebula. I think uh, the other two, I don't know, I quite like them, but it is the Ghost Head Nebula. Um, well done to the 14% who got that. Um, I mean, is that one or is that two? I think it's about one. Yep, um, I think so. So well done you. <laughs> Was that you, James? <laughs> 
Uh, that was not me, no. Oh. I, I, I went for the <laughs> devil's nebula. <laughs> Everyone's changing. <laughs> People changing their answers. Yeah. <laughs> We're on to you. We know you're lying. <laughs> <laughs> James, how could you? How could you? It's very obvious that it changes after we say it. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I think I'll pass over to Annabelle for this next one. Um, you know that uh, the scores are not uh, counting, so it doesn't matter if you have the right answer at the end. Yeah. <laughs> So you don't have to change your answer. <laughs> okay, so next question. It's up. Um, cool. So what Halloween item does this remind you of? So you have um, a like greenish uh, nebula of gas. So what does it remind you of? Is it a pumpkin, a ghost, or Evil butterfly, evil butterfly. Sorry, <laughs> I've never seen an evil butterfly before. <laughs> How many have you seen? I do love the concept. <laughs> yeah, it's like one thing that is so beautiful, and you make it evil. <laughs> Aren't yeah. moths like evil butterflies? I would say so. That's a very philosophical question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. <laughs> correct um and while we're waiting on the answers uh this is an infrared image that was taken by nasa and um all the greenish is actually like gas and dust and you can see at the center there's like a red dot and this is a massive star so a huge star way bigger than the sun um and it has like outflow so like kind of wind coming from the star and this would be the cause of like pushing away the gas around it so this is why you kind of see holes around the the red dots so i'm switching onto slider right now to see what the answers are oh my god have have uh how did it happen i think i've revealed the answer too quickly <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> i'm so sorry I'm so sorry. I'm a terrible MC. I'm terribly, I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> oh my God, what's going on? What's going it. on? Uh, it's so... good. Before, before you put the right answer, there was actually somebody who wrote for evil, evil butterflies. So whoa, 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 whoa! What is going on? Well, we're going to, we're going doing? to other ones. Yeah, what's going on? <laughs> I'm not doing this, guys. Oh my God, maybe it's me. Sorry, guys. Oh my God, no, that's me. <laughs> Okay, wow. so Kaylee, so I think you revealed the answer. Can I just stop? I'll do that. Yeah, all right. Blame it on me. Sure. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Okay, so so jokes aside, let's hope um, coming back to the game, the answers are split: eighty-eight percent pumpkin, thirteen percent ghost, and nobody for evil butterfly. <laughs> so, what is the correct answer? Having uh, let's assume that we haven't seen it before. <laughs> um yeah so it's the pumpkin and if you go back to the slides i am back there cool um you can actually see um an animation that nasa did uh for one of the Halloween where it was released um and you can see it changing from green to red and uh putting that uh pumpkin face <laughs> on it so that was a release from nasa and one of the halloween <laughs> i think it was last year um yeah so nasa has fun during halloween um and it's kind of the same thing than what james was talking about during the talk so the like greenish gas is um an infrared so we are deciding what color we'll put it in so we can make it a pumpkin if we want to Exactly. <laughs> nice. All right, shall I switch this? The slide? top tip. The top tip. Carve your pumpkins like galaxies and nebula this this Halloween. Yeah, and also the name of this nebula is really Jack o' Lantern Nebula. It's the real name. <laughs> wow, cool. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, we we astronomers do have a sense uh, of uh, humor, <laughs> contrary to. Um, 
to to some of us. It's so. great. Everything is either some long uh, like numbers and letters, or it's got a fantastic name. It's it's very rarely in between. <laughs> Yeah. So speaking of fantastic names, I've just switched the slide and I see some more Ooh. fantastic names as well. Yep. Um, so this one, uh, clearly this, uh, that top uh, bit there is a, uh, is a face. Um, so simply the question is, what is this picture? It is, a, uh, is it the Phantom of the Opera? Uh, is it the surface of Mars? Is it from the Atacama Desert in, uh, on Earth? Or is it again Haley when she's had too many drinks? Oh come on! <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I've I've just moved to Slido, and I think we're almost people are almost unanimous saying it's the surface of Mars. But there is this one I think, but yeah, one person standing. <laughs> Haley, you're oh, very Hayley's popular. Got a fan. <laughs> yeah, Haley's got a fan. <laughs> what? Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, of course, people are right. Uh, people are right, even. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've this just shown the correct uh, answer. Yeah. So, the surface of Mars. It was uh, taken. This image was taken in 1976 from NASA's Viking One um, uh, orbiter, um, and it's just a pile of rocks, or so they say. Could it be something spookier? Ooh. Who knows? <laughs> exactly. Um, we're not ones to peddle conspiracy theories, but we'll leave it to your imagination. <laughs> well, someone else just voted for me. <laughs> <laughs> you have two funds now. Two. My favorite Haley answer is yet to come. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey. Anyway, spoiler. anyway, we've got um, we've got the next um, next picture up. Who's taking this one up? That's me. So um, what do you think this gassy object is? So it's again, like a bit orangey, a bit like the image in the back of my um, slide. But what is this one? Is it a galaxy cluster? So a galaxy cluster is just like uh, thousands of galaxy that stay together because of gravity. Is it a star and its disk? So the disk around the star, or is it a nebula like we saw in other pictures uh, in that game? Can I just say I'm glad that you didn't have the gassy object as Haley was. <laughs> <laughs> we were originally going to do it as option D for all of them. We thought that might be too harsh. <laughs> so, uh, so this one actually is very pol polarizing. We've got nine votes and equal split among all three. Ooh. First time. That's uh, that's pretty neat. Would you like me to reveal the answer? Yeah, let's go. Go for it. Do -do -do it's a galaxy cluster. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So it's the galaxy cluster called Perseus, and it's uh, a big zoom on the center of it. Um, and at the center, there is also a huge black hole uh, with jets. Um, this this picture was actually taken from. Um, uh, my supervisor. So it's an image from Cambridge. Cool. Oh, he didn't take it, but he's the one who like created the image from observation. <laughs> went outside with his, with his phone. <laughs> Just went outside. <laughs> it's a X-ray image. So it's a mission in um, X-rays, which are super energetic. Yeah. That's pretty cool. So that's uh, I wouldn't have said I wouldn't have said that was Perseus have, at the first glance, but just because I'm so used to seeing the large scale yeah. structure <laughs> that I was like, hmm, hmm, what is what this? Is this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same. <laughs> All right. Uh, so switching gears, we've got the next question up. Ooh. Yeah. So uh, this very eerie, very very Halloweeny type one, um, sort of a, a face looking off into space um and there's a wonderful false color again what james is talking about the false color image here in this uh in this green so uh what, what is this called so we've got some more creative names here um so the old woman the witch head or the crooked nose nebula um again while people vote we give some more information it's in the it's in the orion uh region of space um, and also it was taken with the, uh, the Wired Field Infrared uh, Survey Explorer, which has got the wonderful acronym WISE, 
we all know that astronomers, as well as uh, naming things, like to give great acronyms to their projects. Um, so that's another one there, WISE. Although they just missed out the F from world, Wide Field. So. <laughs> Well, That's five. something we do a lot in actual. That's something you do a lot, yeah. <laughs> Just choose the letter we want to create the acronym. <laughs> yeah. Actually, there's a great page maintained by uh, Harvard where it's a list of silly acronyms. Um, I'll tweet it out later for anyone who uh, wants to go see that. So check out our, our Twitter. I love that page. It's so great. <laughs> it's great. Uh, agree. <laughs> agree. So as we were talking, actually, uh, answers started shifting. So we've got... Mm. Um, so we've got... Um, most people voting for the Witch Head Nebula. Then we've got the Crooked Nose Nebula. I like that one. Mm -hmm. And we've got the Old Woman Nebula at the last, but there's still <laughs> still somebody voted. I'm actually quite curious Ooh. because I genuinely don't know the name. Uh, so shall I reveal the answer, guys? Yeah. Okay. Oh, it's the Witch Head. Yeah, yeah I mean, it makes it's sense. It's the Witch Head. It kind of makes sense. Uh, it's sort of cackling off into space. Um, well done, everyone who got that. Um, yeah, you can, it's it's a very Halloweeny type image. The uh, it almost looks photoshopped, to be honest. Um, but yeah, it's um, the interesting uh, the the actual color itself, although it's a false color. Obviously, we do see that light. Um, and it is a nebula which is being illuminated by its next door neighbor, uh, the star Regal. Um, so the light is actually reflecting off that dust, and it's sort of a, in real life, it's sort of a bluish kind of color. But they've given it this green highlight to make it look extra spooky, I think. Nice. Um, so we've moved on to the... Oh, wow. That's a good one. We've moved on to the next picture. <laughs> Pretty awesome. Yeah. So what do you think is this creepy image? In my opinion, it's the like spookiest one. It you know, I mean, Annabelle were talking about this before. It generally, yeah. genuinely creeps me out, this one. I don't know why. <laughs> I think it's the center bit. It looks so much like an eye. It's just yeah. it's quite creepy. Like it's not like Halloween team, but it's just very creepy. <laughs> so, do you think it's an ancient Egyptian act artwork? Do you think it's a CGI from a '90s film, or do you think it's a nebula? So, um, to give you the rough split of the answer, so we've got people mostly voting for the nebula. However, there is a couple of votes saying it's a CGI. Nobody voted for ancient Egyptian artwork. I think that was easily okay. rolled out. <laughs> but yeah, um, Nebula seems to be winning. And I think, uh, I think we can reveal the answer straight away, right? Because it yeah. actually is, uh, is a Nebula. What's the name? Um, it's called the Hourglass Nebula. It was taken in 1996, so a long time ago. And they actually don't know exactly how this Nebula was formed. So um, the theory is probably that there is gas that goes like from the center to like is it, it's expanding, but uh, there's actually like winds from um, the star at the center that it is actually going faster than the clouds clouds that are expanding, which would create this like kind of hourglass shape. Um, but I actually don't know why the center is like bluish with a dark spot. Like it's really creepy and we don't really know how it's created. So it's even more creepier. <laughs> I see. Fair point. So steering away, uh, steering away from the creep, I've just moved. Oh, wow. So I've just moved to uh, another yeah. image. <laughs> now that's confusing. It is kind of uh, just weird, this one, isn't it? Um... So the question is, where was it taken? Uh, people will be voting. Um, so it's, oh, just uh, in the answer. Yeah. <laughs> this is my favorite answer for Haley. Um, <laughs> is it? Uh, so is it uh, from the set of Star Wars? It kind of looks like a Tuscan Raider on Tatooine or something like that. I don't know. Uh, is it on Mars? Is it on Mercury? Or, and this, I, I would vote for this one. Uh, is it Haley on her way back from the pub, sort of uh, very respectfully walking home? Very respectfully, yes, of course. <laughs> um, it lost, but... Uh... It does look familiar now that you know. <laughs> <laughs> Now that you mention it, right? So when, uh, when returning back to Slido, we, we have most votes for Mars, 
then for some reason the Vo the Mercury got swapped to Venus in Slido. <laughs> uh, so I that think that gave it fault. away. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so we've It'd got... be great if it was that one. Yeah, so no, but we've got most votes for Mars. Then we've got a set of Star Wars as a second one. Haley <laughs> takes strong third. <laughs> and then we've got oh, Venus slash Mercury. So um yeah, good job, everyone. Uh, I will reveal the answer, and uh, I am really upset that this wasn't Haley. But uh, but jokes aside, it was Mars. I'm surprised. No, 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 no. The stream just kind of paused, and once we're back streaming, oh yeah, 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 we're back, we're back. Are we back? I think we're back. Uh, can <laughs> someone <laughs> confirm we're back? I think we're back. Yes, yes, so we're definitely uh we're definitely back live. So what happened was the streaming software got spooked out and it decided to kick us out. Are we back though? <laughs> I think we are. I think we really yeah. are. Um you can tell us if you can hear us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah they... somebody said that yes, we're back. back. Woo! <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh thanks, Abigail. Um very proud of you telling us we're back. Thank you. Uh, so, <laughs> as we were laughing at Haley going back home, uh, as we were laughing at uh, Haley going back home, uh, what were we talking about? That that the set is Mars. That is Mars. That is actually yeah, Mars. Yeah, it is Mars. Yeah. So it was. Um, it was yeah the Mars uh, rover Spirit in two thousand seven, and this is a panorama looking westwards. Um, this is incredibly zoomed in on a rock formation of some type, or so NASA would have you believe. Um, but it's looking westwards towards a sunset. Um, so if you go, um, if you Google Mars Bigfoot, I think that's what uh, that's what this will come up as. Um, Fairly yeah, appropriate. Uh, yeah, but you can download the whole image, and it is actually a really cool, just nice look towards the sunset. We we had a comment that you can see Mars really brightly tonight. By the way, mm. on YouTube. So I think I think you need to look south. Thanks yeah, for maybe. pointing that out, James. Maybe you can see Bigfoot as well. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Probably. So I've just switched the slides, and um, we've got the image that is right behind uh, Annabelle right now. Yeah. So the question is, how big is the M87 black hole? So the black hole that they took a picture of. Um, we kind of talked about sizes during, well, masses during the talk. So let's see if you all remember. I think the audience does, uh, because we've got um, 6.5 billion solar masses as being the most, uh, the most popular answer. Although there are still some takes on millions and trillions, you know. Uh, not bad. Mm -hmm. No bad at all. Should we reveal the answer? Yes, let me uh, reveal the answer. I also... Um, do, do, do. Oh! Oh! People cheat! People start changing the answers. That's not nice. <laughs> okay, yeah, so... Uh, so it's 6.5 billion solar masses, as uh, as we've discussed before. Yeah. I mean, seven is one of the big ones. Uh, that's why we're able to take a picture of it. Uh, because it's so big and it's kind of close, like it's not close, but it's close for taking an image of a black hole. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's actually, there's only two black holes that will be ever able to take a picture, at least with the telescope we have currently. So it's this one because it's pretty big and kind of close. And there's the one at the center of our galaxy because it's close, very close. And it's a bit less big though. Um, I think it's like a thousand times smaller. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, in the future, in the next couple of years, I guess we'll get a picture of the black hole at the center of a galaxy. They just had some technical issue, I think, when they took the image the first time. And, uh, there's only one time per year that they can take that picture. So they had to wait and a whole cycle some time. Yeah. Um, if you go to the next slide, if you I have the next slide, cool. Uh, it's pretty nice. Uh, the uh, XKCD CD did like kind of a, a comic with it, so you can actually see the solar system inside that black hole, and um, you have like the sun at the center, and then you have like the orbit of Pluto, so you can see that 
uh, that black hole is way bigger than our solar system. So it gives you an idea how huge black holes can be, and it's a bit scary, I think, in my opinion. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I do study black hole, but looking at black holes at night, I think it's scary to me. <laughs> I'm looking at them during the day. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. It's like the feeling of you're in the dark and there's like an image of a black hole and you just like imagine how big those are and how we don't understand. I don't know. It's maybe just me. <laughs> you're safe, Annabelle. We've been over this. There's not in the soul. <laughs> I think. Well, I think maybe there is. Day. Yeah. <laughs> It's maybe more the like huge like idea of it, how big they are, not like the fact that they could eat us. It's more like <laughs> thinking about them. Oh well, we can go to the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> that was very smooth, Annabelle. <laughs> Moved on. <laughs> yep. Okay. So the slide is up. Thanks. So it's our last question of the evening. Uh, what is this web-like image? So you see obviously a web-like image. Um, do you think it's a poster from Stranger Things? The, it's a series on Netflix. If you didn't watch it, it's pretty good. Uh, so do you think it's from there? <laughs> <laughs> is it a paid advertisement? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the link in the description. <laughs> <laughs> Is it a, a dark matter simulation or is it a map of magnetic field, a magnetic line, sorry, on the sun? So I've just pulled up the slider result and unfortunately nobody voted for Stranger Things, but we've got an exactly even split between dark matter simulation Ooh. and the magnetic field lines. So many, any further okay. comments to tease us a little bit on the last question or shall I reveal the answer? Maybe you can reveal the answer. Okay. I don't want to give the answer away. <laughs> so it's actually... Oh, wait, 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 wait. I've revealed the answer and answers changed. Hmm. <laughs> we can see <laughs> you. <laughs> so yeah, it's a, it's a dark matter simulation and uh, someone uh, has just changed their mind. So uh, now we've got more correct answers on the dark matter simulation. Uh, I think at a first glance, uh, if I go back to the slide, um, the presentation... At a first glance, it's not hard to confuse it with the magnetic field lines on the sun, especially um, especially if you think about um, the daily monitoring apps that you can download on your phone. And when they go into magnetic fields, they're actually black and white. So, uh, mm. or like the scales of gray or blue. So that's, uh, that's very easy to confuse. And they also have this rejoining, reconnecting pattern. And yeah. um, so it does look like a net. Nice, very good. Uh, very good game. I really enjoyed that, guys. Thank you. Yeah, that was you can, great. Thanks, yeah. guys. Good. You can go to the next slide, and we Ooh. have a nice image also. It's not a game, but it's pretty nice. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So I got confused. There's so many great images. Uh, if yeah. you just Google like uh, like Halloween astronomy or like spooky astronomy or something, there's this whole like pages just dedicated to. There's a lot of creepy stuff out there in the space. So. <laughs> So the um, last uh, the last image shows. Uh, oh yeah, there are uh, what looks like, like little little devils like going yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, <laughs> happy Halloween. <laughs> yeah, that's so creepy. <laughs> yeah, and this one is also a nebula, like just gas and dust, but it's pretty cute. <laughs> yep, I I agree. I agree. One of them even has a tail. That's so weird. <laughs> Anyway, uh, on that note, uh, I think uh, I think we're coming uh, to an end. Sorry for uh, the technical problems. Um, thank you very much, James, for your wonderful talk and uh, the patience in uh, responding to questions. There were there were tons. Uh, as a final remark, I just wanted to say that I am <laughs> dressed up <laughs> as a not my own theoretical physicist because I have a black hole, a real existing solution on one side. And a white hole, the mathematically existing but physically uh, physically discarded solution on the other side. And because I exist, I'm a nightmare. Can yeah. I have a laughter? <laughs> that was supposed to be funny. Okay, so uh, it was it was just much funnier in my head. Uh, but that's okay. It's okay. It looks like spider web. Uh, I think I fit into the Halloween theme.
but and I think we can all actually appreciate your like skills in like doing like face paint makeup like yeah. that's oh yeah that's really cool <laughs> <laughs> okay okay I'm gonna pat myself on the uh, on the back no oh, but totally but jokes aside, um, once again, uh, thanks a lot, James. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much for this awesome talk. And hopefully yeah. we can um, we can see you at the AOT um, sometime again, if you enjoyed the experience, the spooky experience. It was great. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Next time in the pub, hopefully. <laughs> oh, next time in a real pub. Exactly. <clears throat> So on that note, uh, everyone, please uh, look out for, for the mask that might be visible as it was pointed out. And uh, have a wonderful... Not so spooky evening, everyone. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye.